And it's showtime. Good evening, and this is the final speaker workshop talk of the day. Again, thank you so much for spending your day and time with us. Uh, we're very grateful. We're very, very grateful, and also uh, it's amazing to see everyone here. I mean, I, I guess I'll, I'll be honest is that we did not anticipate people to be like standing like deep, 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 and also sitting on the floor for this talk. And as I said earlier, a number, a few times, uh, we've saved, uh, we've saved the, uh, we've saved the best for last for today, because it is our honor, um, it is certainly our honor and our privilege to have a very, very, uh, very, very special guest, uh, very, very special speaker today, um, uh, Ryan Mitchell. And uh, before Ryan, before I pass the mic over to Ryan, how many of you here are Python fans? Are fans of Python? So uh, Ryan, Ryan um, is uh, not only a DEF CON alumni, she spoke last year um, at DEF CON 23. She is also the author of an O'Reilly book called um, Web Scraping with Python. And we are very honored and very, very privileged to have Ryan Mitchell um, to give uh, the last talk of the day and arguably the blockbuster. Without much ado, Ryan Mitchell. All right. Thank you very much. All right. So my name's up there. Um, my Twitter is also up there in case you want that later. I think I'll find some safe internet after this and then upload the, uh, the files to Twitter. So who am I? Um, I am a senior developer at Hedgester. We are an enterprise. Uh, enterprise analytics, software management for hedge fund, I don't even know. Um, anyway, uh, I wrote two books, which is what I actually talk about, because no one wants to hear about the first thing. Uh, web Scraping with Python in 2015, uh, and Instant Web Scraping with Java, uh, which isn't quite as good, but, uh, you know, it's packed. Um, I am also teaching web development class at the Boston Public Library in the fall, and uh, a data science course at my alma mater, Olin College of Engineering. Go Phoenixes! All right, so who puts about me slides and DEF CON talks? That's super lame. Um, my background is a little different than all y'all's. I am not like a network packet hacker networking person. Um, so I'm, as hopefully you gathered, um, I am a software engineer and a data scientist and a web scraper, and I do a lot of that stuff. Uh, but I was talking to Davin Potts uh, six months ago. I don't know if you know him. He's involved in, ah, there he is, Davin. And we were talking at a conference in Austin, and he said, hey, I, you know, I really enjoyed your talk about web scraping. Maybe you said that. I don't remember. Eh, you don't have to have enjoyed it. That's fine. Um, but he said, you know, you should do a talk at Wall of Sheep. Uh, maybe about the intersection of Wall of Sheeping and web scraping. And I thought, I don't even know what that would, what? But I thought about it for a while. And here's what I came up with. So traditional web scraping. Um, Automated data collection. Generally, when you're scraping the web, you want to get data. Uh, web scrapers tend to behave like humans in a lot of ways. So they request URLs. They parse HTML data for the most part. Um, if they get really frustrated by just parsing the HTML data, they, they automate web browsers. They say, fuck it, we'll just, we'll just automate the entire web browser. Uh, they tend to navigate through hyperlinks like humans do, right? Uh, they write requests and they deal with one response at a time. They deal with security if they need to for the goal of data collection. Traditional wall of sheeping, right? Uh, so it passively monitors all traffic across the network. So you're not just, you know, make a request, get something back, uh, but you're just sort of monitoring traffic. Um, scripts are usually very unhuman-like, right? No one would, would watch that traffic and say, oh, someone must be uh, browsing around my website. Um, they tend to focus on the transport layer, like lower, la um, relatively lower layer of, of internet protocol. Um, and then they, they focus on data collection for the goal of security rather than dealing with security for the goal of data collection. So what's the internet section between those two? So I'm moving up the, the internet protocol stack a bit and I'm going to focus on the presentation layer. I know it's going to be really weird, but you guys can do it. Um, but still, monitoring all traffic. I really like that concept. I think that's a good one that we can all take from Wall of Sheep. Monitor all the traffic initiated by a single page load and focus on data search and extraction. So why is this needed? I mean, 
web scraping isn't broke, why do, we, why do we need this, right? Here's why. Okay, so you probably have all seen JavaScript around, right? And it keeps coming, and it keeps coming. There are so many JavaScripts, and everyone puts all their shit in your browser, right? So this is how the web used to work. Okay, I made these myself. Uh, you have the database, you have your API layer, you have some shit going on on the server, you have your little web service, you have your user, and you have this theoretically impenetrable wall, right? And I say theoretically because this is DEF CON and that's kind of the point, you know? Um, but theoretically, happy HTML file. All right, now we have jQuery. And fun fact, as of August 26, jQuery will be 10 years old. Yeah, yeah, I feel old too, right? Um, so then we start having all these little formatting interaction things. You click a thing, a thing pops up, it's so cute. Oh, look at the, the website, it's so, so awesome and new. Um, so, but you have your happy HTML file back here, and you got some little DOM rendering, and the user's happy. You have some happy little Ajaxes, maybe, eventually, stuff going on. All right. This is what it looks like today, right? We have this sad HTML file. It's like HTML, head, and head, body, stuff goes here, and body, and HTML, oh. And that's all the web scrapers are seeing, right? Like the user's happy because they're using a browser and, and they have the whole fucking server in their browser and it's taking up five gigabytes of RAM, right? I've, I've talked to people who are like, we don't have a content management system. We have a client side web application with an API. It's like, well, <laughs> what the fuck do you think a CMS is? Like, <laughs> okay, and then you, you have like a thin layer that we don't have to worry about. Happy little clouds. Oh yeah, that's the other problem. Then you have like external, external things going on and who knows what that is. Oh, the web scraper is so sad now because all, all he's getting is this little, little HTML file. None of this stuff. He can't see any of it. Ah, this is why we have Selenium, right? Selenium to the rescue. All right, so instead of like making a little script and getting your sad little HTML file, We'll just script the browser. We can use browsers like normal human beings, human beings. And we'll have the browser go out to the website and it will be our little server for us and, and it'll render the DOM for us and we're so happy. Ooh, oh no, this is terrible because to scrape the web, sometimes you need thousands of page loads, right? And you need to do them really fast because you don't want your computer to be taken over, your server to be taken over for days and days doing this stupid browser that takes up five gigabytes of RAM. Okay. So here's the data you actually want. Is that red thing? That's the data they actually want. That's like a JSON or an XML or something like that. But we still use Selenium and why do we do this? So analyzing APIs and server communication is often thought of as the domain of security, which is why we're all here, but not data collection. I mean, obviously there are a lot of overlaps. People want to protect their data. They take security measures to protect it, right? Um, but people who scrape the web are usually more like data scientists or researchers and they have reasons they want to collect all this data and they're not really like security nerds like we all are. Um, so they dig around in APIs, they get all like, oh, am I hacking? I don't know, this is weird. Uh, it's also difficult to trudge through, right? Like I kind of implied, like data scientists, not always programmers. We really like link tags. This is a subtle one. Um, so since the 90s, this whole Google thing was invented. And what did it do? It crawled through websites. It followed these link tags, these anchor tags. Um, what have we completely ignored? The fact that link tags only link to HTML, right? Well, now the data's not in the HTML, it's in the other places. Um, but still, whenever we build crawlers, whenever we build web scrapers, we always base them on finding these anchor tags, these link tags, and then we follow those, and all we get is HTML, and we're really pissed off when that happens. What's up with that? Um, and then the big one is, when you have a hammer like Selenium, Every page looks like an L. 
Uh, whenever you look at web scraping resources on the internet, people say, oh, I have this JavaScript problem. What should I do? And people are like, just, just look at Selenium. Just take it. It's fine. Go. You're fine. Uh, and we've never really thought past that because it works. It's really slow. You know, it, it takes up a ton of memory, but it works. I'm also guilty of this. All right. No, it's actually, those are my two worst reviews. It actually has 4.6 stars on Amazon. It's being translated into Russian right now, which is like its fifth language. It sold over 20,000 copies, which apparently is a lot for a technical book. I had no idea. Uh, not a lucrative field. Um, but yeah, still doing good. Anyway, summary of chapter 10. This is what I did when I wrote chapter 10. I mean, there's more to it, but this is basically it. Use Selenium. Wait for things to load. Parse website as usual. Pretend the DOM is the HTML. You'll be fine. So, check this out. This kind of works, right? So here is CrossFit.com. This is actually, this isn't a totally random website. I just found someone actually asked me to scrape this for money, which was weird. Uh, what this guy wanted was the address and contact information of all of these different CrossFit sites. And you actually have to, oh, now it popped up. Look at that. So this is HTML. It's not some like weird, weird flash thing, but these are all SVGs. And I, I would not even know because you have to click down in all of these to even get the thing to pop up. Oh, that's weird. How would you scrape that? Even with the Selenium, like can't be done. You, I mean, give me a couple of weeks and like, I don't know. But look at this. What is this site? Oh, this is, I kind of screwed up. Oh, there we go, okay. Oh, look at that. Look at all these things. Oh, what are all these things? My browser can't even load all of it. There are so many things. Oh, and look at this. Oh, apparently you get the affiliate IDs from over there, and oh, there you go. And it turns out you can literally just iterate through all these. It starts from zero, goes up to like 9,000 something. <laughs> Yeah, that works way better. Okay. So why do we keep making web scrapers look like humans, right? So I give a lot of talks about scraping and web security, and I always describe this arms race, where we say, hey, you don't have the right headers. You look like a Python script. So the Python scripts start putting headers in to look like humans. And then the, the web scrapers say, wait a minute, you're moving around the website way too fast. You filled out that form too quickly. So then the scrapers say like, oh, I'll fill out the form slower, I'll type slower, I'll press the button slower. And they're like, wait a minute, you don't even know what that image says. And the web scrapers are like, OCR, right? But sometimes what you really need is this, right? This isn't a human, but it gets the job done a lot better, right? So why should we use APIs? Uh, admins add bot, add bot protection to the front end uh, because it's really easy. It's really easy to do block the scrapers. APIs take a lot of thought. Um, it's, it's definitely not impossible. It's not even that hard, but it takes thought, which is a problem for some, some web, web developers. Uh, the problem is that when, you make an a when your browser makes an API request, it is essentially a bot making an API request, right? Your browser is a little program and it sends requests off and it gets things back and, you know, um, and so it's, it's much easier for a script to emulate the actions of just the browser than it is for a script to emulate the actions of a human, if that makes sense. So security is a little trickier with that sort of thing. Um, it's a much lighter load for both servers and clients, obviously. It's a lot easier to parse, right? Uh, I'd rather just like dump some JSON and then pick out the thing I want than try to figure out what their template's doing to the front end and why does the title look like that and how do I take off the dollar sign and I don't know. Um, a lot more metadata, extra information. I found this really cool API at Target uh, where you can tell, so they have the sell price there and you can tell when the sell price went into effect and when it's gonna be gone, which is really cool. Uh, but they don't tell you that on the front of the website. You can only see that in the API that gives you the, sells, the sell price. Um, scrape once, run everywhere. Okay, so here's the thing. You have to use Selenium to get all the APIs in the first place. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but once you do that, you use, use Selenium a couple of times, great. Now you can do your thousands of requests. 
Um, and then API requests, of course, could be modified in ways that the original site didn't intend, right? So iterating through ID numbers to get all the pieces of data, like in the CrossFit example, automating pagination, um, you know, another obvious one, changing parameters to return lots of results instead of just the ones you want. Again, target.com, look at stores near me. Oh, 10 results. What if I make it 10,000 results? Oh, look, it's all of the targets, right? Um, I love Target because they don't really protect their APIs that much, so it's a lot of fun. Okay, okay, you get it. We should use APIs, we find APIs, we should stop using Selenium so much, but how do I do it, Ryan? All right, so this is what I've been working on. Um, it's an API scraping tool, and you can run it from the command line, um, and you can pass in these cool, little, these cool little flags. So here's your URL, U for URL, D for directory, um, and then S for search string, and you can use any combination of these things that you want. Um, so let me do a little example. I don't know about the internet right now, not because of security, but because I tried this last time and it was super slow and Selenium loads up and it takes forever, but I do have a directory um, full, of, uh, full of fun things. So this is just like, it puts these into HAR files. HAR stands for HTTP archive. Um, so Selenium loads up, I have a huge stack of things, pushes this into JSON files, and then I parse them. All right. So it finds all these API responses, um, and there are a few methods of, of printing them out. You can do, H uh, obviously, to the browser. You can do one of these things. You can view it as a HTML page, there's also a JSON file that's pretty cool. Um, but you might be saying, wait a minute, this is just the same thing that, you know, we can do dumps anywhere, right? But not dumps like this. Okay, so like I said before, you have a stack of Python, Selenium, Firefox, Firebug, and uh, export, bunch of stuff with a, a layer of uh, Python script on top. Um, parse the resulting HAR files, the HP archive files for interesting stuff. Um, then you can format the API call data in a useful way, which I don't think anyone's really done before. Um, and then step two, this is a sort of like run anywhere step, right? Which I am just starting to sort of think about and automate to some extent. Um, but you, the goal is to find the useful specific uh, targeted API call uh, to gather further data. And of course, the big challenge of that is once you find the API call, how do you iterate for the parameters and essentially crawl the site to iterate through those parameters? But I have some thoughts on this. All right. Um, so here's what it does. Uh, it crypts the a API calls with the same path, and it records all the parameter values. So you have like, uh, you know, key value, key value, key value, seen for each key. Um, so it obviously recognizes the API calls that they have the same path, and it uh, records any new keys it sees, but it also takes all the values that it sees and says like, oh, for this key, here are the, the array of values that you can, that you can put here. Um, collects key values for both get and post. Post key value pairs are a little bit different. Um, and it determines whether the parameters are necessary or not. So what it'll do is it'll take an API call, and it'll just like one by one take off the parameters and then it'll send the, the call back and say like, oh, was the response the same? Um, and then it, it'll just like take those off and put them in a special little we don't need you anymore group if, uh, if it turns out that the API response is unchanged. Um, then obviously several different types of data outputs depending on what you're into, HTML, JSON, or the console. Um, and then the cool thing about this is that they have, I have these in the nice little Python objects and I, I think there's a lot of flexibility there for more advanced parsing. So a little more about the unnecessary parameters. So you might have something like this, which is a real API call from target. Um, and then they have this, and I think that this is just like some internal tracking metric. Uh, so it's probably best that we got, get rid of it. It might be dangerous. All right, path values is arguments. This is the trickiest one. Um, and so you have this thing here at the end is that, that's obviously a parameter because we're humans and we can look at that and say, oh yeah, that's a parameter. Um, but what if it said uh, similar products? 
Is it the fact that it's numbers? Does that mean it's an argument instead of a, an important path thing? I don't know. So I did some best guessing with that. I said, well, if it's at the end and I see a lot of similar API calls, and it has a lot of numbers in it, then it's probably a parameter. But that's a really tricky one. That's one I'm still working on. Um, but it does group those the same way it would group them um, if they were the exact same path with different values. And I keep track of the, the path parameters in a different way. OK, so there are a lot of short-term directions to go in with this. So obviously, more development with the web-based tool, drill down to explore APIs. And this one is, a, is really important for me because I think that it will really allow people who may not have the programming experience um, to say, oh, wow, this is awesome. There's all my data right there. Done. I don't need to bother with Selenium anymore. Um, also, some APIs hide their content type. So they could say, oh, no, this is just plain text, but actually it's JSON or something. Um, so you know that would slow the runtime a little bit to like try to parse everything as every single category of, of response that we might be looking for. But it could also be useful. Um, also, I'm not doing any cookie tracking right now. I found that it's it's not that big of a deal. Like websites don't really seem to care one way or the other. Uh, what I found is that the front end always cares. Like the front end of the website, like super duper cares what your cookies are and what they say and what your user agent is. But the APIs eh, not so much, uh, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, search for other kinds of result content, uh, CSV, plain text. JavaScript is such a weird thing. I don't know, sometimes people put data in the JavaScript and it would be absolutely possible to uh, search for a specific string in JavaScript. So maybe they embed like the title of a page that you want in some convoluted, stupid JavaScript text file. Sure, I could do that. As far as actually parsing the, it as data, data and putting it in some useful format, that's, that's another stretch. So I've kind of ignored JavaScript. Um, this is the cool thing. So remember when I said earlier about uh, traditional web scraping being lame, or web crawling being lame because it only follows like the anchor tags? When we get all the, this response content back and we can actually treat it like data, we can actually look for URLs, not URLs in the DOM and not URLs in the HTML and anchor tags, but any URLs. And we can see if they're internal or external. I don't really bother with external, like following external URLs so much because then you're out in the wide open internet and who knows. Um, but internal URLs, following those, seeing where those lead, that would be pretty cool. And then automating the second step. So this is the one where you get the API that you want. You say, this is my search string, and this is like the title of the page or the price of the product or something, and I've entered this, and I get this API back, and apparently this thing has it. Um, but how might you be able to sort of automate the rest of the script and go out and find all of the other prices and all of the other titles and all of the other images and all the things that you want to really build up your database from just one instance? Um, so currently, the user enters a complete search string to match on with the page that it's found on. Uh, the web scraper automatically identifies two pieces of information, which API call returns the search string. And this is already done and where, the where in the response that information is located. So we can tell whether or not it's XML or, or JSON or whatever, and we can also record, oh, you go this way down the tree and, and your search string is here. And we can assume that with all the similar API calls, you go this way down the string, it's always gonna be there every single time. Now here's the trick. You need to find those similar API calls, right? Um, and to find those similar API calls, you need to be able to iterate the parameter values. Um, so we can find the parameter values required for the API call. That's already done. Um, and where those parameter values can be found. OK. This is a little tricky. So you're treating the parameter values as a search string again. And you are searching for them in the content. Then you find. Other search parameters. So the, um, the scraper must identify locations of analogous API calls and their associated parameters. Um, and this can be done by identifying analysis URLs, not necessarily HTML URLs, uh, that, that link to these required API call parameters. Um, and then as a side note also, some parameters aren't necessarily like uh, letter, number, combination product IDs, but they're just like zip codes or like I showed you before, the incremented IDs, and, and those are a pretty trivial case. Um, although recognizing as a zip code and saying, oh, here's a list of zip codes. I don't know how far I want to take it. All right. 
So here's a more concrete example. Um, let's say you have a, a, uh, a website, a web page, an HTML, piece of HTML that you are searching um, products, prod name, blarg123, note that that is not indicative of anything. Uh, and you're searching for the string, the product name. You want to collect a list of product names from this website, right? Um, so you go and you do the Selenium thing on this page, and you find that, oh, hey, there's this cool API that returns the product name. Okay, so that's probably the one that I want. That is the target, not target the store. Oh God, this is confusing. Uh, not target the store, but target like the goal API call that contains the information we want. Um, so the path is that, and the parameters are that, right? Um, and then you find that there are several different API calls of this exact same format in this second API call, this related products type equals some market segment not related to anything else. Great, awesome. So now you have a second API and you're building this thing sort of recursively down. Uh, and the market segment, that parameter, we can use that as a search string and we can see has anything we've seen so far in this path had that parameter in it, okay? And then we say, oh, that page does. In practice, maybe this little recursive thing could go down for a really, really long time, right? So then you have this product info page that you use to get the uh, ID, the string search term market segment that you then use to get a list of related products, okay? Now you go to all those related products, product infos page, and then you get another market segment, right? And then you go to all their related product pages, and then you get the product info pages for them. And all of a sudden, you've built this sort of crawler that's not crawling through the HTML website. It's literally crawling through the APIs by doing like a one-time analysis of the network traffic for a single page load. And there's... Actually, this is more confusing than now than when I wrote it. This kind of goes like this until eventually you can loop it back up around. So that would be cool. All right, this seems really complicated, Ryan. What are you doing? Um, yeah, it might be complicated, but so are a lot of modern web scraping tools. And I find that a little bit of complexity on the back end can save people a lot of headache and maybe help them discover things that they might not have seen otherwise um, and discover useful tricks and, and even some vulnerabilities, who knows. Uh, we also need to stop thinking of web scraping as just scraping front end pages containing data, right? And it's really tempting because we see that data in our browser and we're like, oh, I want that one, right? And then we write the script, we're like, get me that one. But really, we need to be thinking about it as a collection of calls, and increasingly so with all the JavaScript we're seeing now. Um, and we also need to stop thinking about web crawling as traversing anchor tags. We need, about, we need to start thinking about it as uh, finding addresses for things, and finding parameters, and figuring out where the information is actually contained, and how it links to other pieces of information. Um, and I really think that applying traffic monitoring techniques, string parsing, and a little common sense to get data better, stronger, and faster is a good thing. All right, any questions? I'm six feet tall. All right. Yes, you there. So running it through a Parsi to see the actual web service calls Yes, that's what I'm doing with Selenium. So you fire up the, the Selenium, it's a browser automation tool, and then I just record all of the web service calls. But the cool thing is you only do that, need to do that for a couple of pages to sort of get the sense of how the website's put together and then create the more generalized approach. Yeah? Oh. I'm not sure, sure how good of a question this is, but um, <laughs> What if, uh, or what do you, what do you do when you start getting throttled by certain web services that after you do all these API calls just kind of cut you off? Is there a way to handle that? Slow down. No, and there's actually a really good reason for this. It's not just being nice. Um, so when you start to get throttled and things like so, okay, uh, terms of service and, and things like that, you could browser wrap and click through and, oh no. I have like a thing stuck in my, my thunder port. It won't quite, that's uh, okay. Um, yeah, so you agree to the thing. 
doesn't actually mean anything until they start sending you cease and desist letters and throttling you and blocking you. Now, if you say, ha, screw them, I don't need to listen to them, uh, I'm just going to you know, use a different IP address and then go somewhere else and go into a Starbucks and open my laptop, ha, huh, they'll never know it's me. Uh, that's where it actually becomes illegal and you can get sued. So don't do that. Uh, what do you do if the entry points are moved all to... What do you do if all the APIs are moved into a single entry point and the parameters are encoded? Well, besides cursing. <laughs> so if the APIs are moved into a single entry point, like all the data you want is in that single entry point? Uh, that's what the old-fashioned web used to be. Right, so we would make this API call, back, call, right, and we would get back this like HTML file that would contain like all the data, right? Okay, maybe I'm misunderstanding. Well, yeah. Okay, let's stay with encoded parameters. Okay. Do you? Okay. Forget the entry points, but uh, encoded parameters, if they're encoded for security reasons. So yeah, encoded parameters. Um, basically all of them are encoded. So you have like a product ID. I, I can't tell what that means, right? It's just like a random string of things. But the thing is you can find that random string of things somewhere else in the vast collection of other information and at some point it kind of has to reference it. So you might find that random string um, and then makes an API call and gets information about the product. Now you know that that product and, or that piece of information and that random string are related, right? Um, and so you might have to load some things to see what they are, but you know, the problem with encoding API responses is that at some point they have to be decoded. Right, and, and we're pretty used to dealing with IDs and random strings and things like that, but at some point, humans have to be able to read it, and there's, there may be a very long sort of daisy chain of things until you can attach the, the encoded thing to the meaning, but at some point it does have a meaning that can be deduced. So I know that's a little hand wavy, but I hope it answers. <laughs> So you had mentioned the issues you were running into uh, detecting if a, uh, sorry, path was parameter, yeah, if the path was a parameter or an input. I was wondering, as you're supplying it, especially with search boxes, if there is something that you automate as part of Selenium to fill in those search boxes and then look back at your paths or other previous API calls to do the looks to see if that path ends up becoming, well, coming from either previous API or your previous provided inputs. Uh -huh. All right, so that's a really good question and a, a couple things about that. So I am not filling out search boxes or doing anything. Um, so actually I, I am moving down the page. I do use the scroll bar to make sure, you know, the page sits around there for a little while and everything has a chance to do its thing. And also um, there's a lot of new stuff where certain scripts won't be activated until you actually view them in the, the browser window. Um, but it doesn't automatically click through anything or mess with things or enter information. You could certainly make it do that. That wouldn't be difficult at all. Uh, but I haven't done that. And so when you, um, and that's a really interesting question. So providing a new path and seeing if the information, if the structure of the information remains the same. And that would be a really good way of doing that. That's certainly something I've thought about. Um, yeah, I could certainly work that in. Uh, the trick is figuring out like, where are these different parameters? Right, so you have this API call, you have a different ending at the end. Um, it would be helpful to see a lot of different examples of that so you could sort of compare the different structures. Um, but sometimes you get that and sometimes you don't. So it's an, a really good idea though. When are you making a burp plugin? When are you making a burp plugin? 
What is a burp? <laughs> what? It's a man-in-the-middle proxy for application security testing. It allows for automated buzzing uh, burp Okay. So I'm crawling the web, and then there's a man in the middle, and then all of a sudden I'm getting back bad web data? What would I do with this? So burp allows for automated reg expression based um, completion and changing of different web requests, as well as keeping the history of the request so that you can like wrap it up into a nice report. And also allows for automated fuzzing of parameters to determine if, for example, SQL injection or other such problems. So with your API calls, it'd be really easy to integrate it into something that's like, hey, these are the things you want to fuzz. So that might be useful. A uh, couple thoughts. First, I'm not really trying to attack the servers. I like the servers. They give me useful data, right? I don't want to inject things into them. Um, and the other thing is, generally with web scraping, you say, OK, I need this list of 10,000 specific things. I want all of these articles. I want all of these different products. I want all of these SEC filings. I want, like, it's a very concrete list. So it's not like throw something random at it and see what comes back. For the most part, it's like I want this concrete set of data. So um, that might be some. It might have some really useful tools. That sounds really cool. I hadn't heard of it, uh, but I think that the application or the yeah the application might be slightly slightly different. But I'll have to check it out. Yeah. You kind of mentioned cookies, but didn't. Uh, but I guess the APIs that you're, you know touching right now, like the target API, doesn't really rely too much on that. But have you run into situations where you have to bootstrap uh, the call with, you know, let's say a cookie uh, value so that you can make all your subsequent calls? And do you, are you kind of thinking of building that into your, your script? So that was actually uh, exactly what I said on my suggested or like future development slide. So right now, I haven't actually had a problem with, with cookies and API calls. Um, I've been testing this across a bunch of different sites, and I've used it for a couple pl practical ap applications. Haven't run into the cookie problem, but it's absolutely a parameter that is important in the web in general, um, and something that would be good to, to build in in the future, and it's easy enough to do. Uh, let's, he's had his... Okay, we got one, yeah, and then we'll come back. Is there any plan for adding this in your book, uh, like a chapter or something? <laughs> O'Reilly said maybe in 2017 we can start talking about like a second edition. So I got, I got plans. I got plans. We'll see. Yeah, question: If you have you used your uh, your scraper on anything that's required authentication or OAuth or anything like that, or have you thought about putting in a, another module for authentication? So uh, one of the things you can do pretty easily is log in with Selenium, because obviously there's a lot of like crazy stuff going on, um, and then you can just copy the cookies. Uh, I haven't had to, but it's it's definitely possible. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely possible. I haven't done it yet, but it might be something that's necessary. Uh, so with Selenium, you can detect Selenium uh, in, from JavaScript um, because it, it, it mutates the API. Have you dealt with anyone who does not what do you want? Mean it mutates the API? It, well, for example, with uh, Firefox driver, uh, they add a web driver property to the navigator element okay. in the DOM. Um, have you gotten into this cat and mouse game at all with the, uh, I'm not a bot, but I'm going to try and look like a bot, um, that type of thing? You know, I keep hearing about this, this Selenium, you can always detect it thing, but I never knew exactly why. And honestly, like I've searched for it, I've never been able to find it, and I've never found a website that blocked me because of it. Um, and that's part, you know, to what I said earlier about like security takes some thought, especially on the API layer rather than like the HTML front end DOM layer. Um, and I've just never seen anyone do it. Okay, I'll check it out. That makes sense. Um, sorry, I guess you can use it to fast things, right? 
So sort of you identify all the API calls and then identify the data structures that you're using and then sort of send them some weird values and see how they react and get that stuff back. So, would you thinking, so I got two questions, uh, uh, sort of that, and then are you coming to the DEF CON party? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yeah, so sending them weird values. You mean like weird hacking values? Or like weird, I want this different set of data values? Because you could do both. I mean, there's nothing stopping you from doing both. Um, but I think one of the things, and maybe this is like the thing that differentiates like hacking from web scraping is what you send at the server. So with web scraping, you generally want to send really great information, like requests to the server that are perfectly valid and will get you valid, useful data back. Um, with hacking, you want to send like totally weird off the wall stuff that you think is going to mess things up or get you into something. Um, and you can absolutely do both. It's up to you. But one of the challenges I'm dealing with is finding those good values to send to the server. Any other questions? Well, I'm going to be around. I'm going to get a drink. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much.